Okay, good evening, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Welcome to another week here in the class. So this week will be order and border. Basically, we'll talk about the formation of states and other parts of governing bodies, okay? So uh, this lesson will be due for the 29th of August. So like I was telling you last week, uh, that's gonna be our last week of August. And then we're going to start cooling down just a little bit in September. So hopefully that's what happens there. Okay. So let me do my usual routine here. Share the screen. Go to the material. Start the slideshow. Oops, I got to minimize myself. There we go. From the beginning. Again, ANT 101 is abbreviation to the course, Introduction to Anthropology. And then you see a little week eight on the bottom. Okay, but again, this is for the 29th, the last week of August. Thank you. Okay, so there's our big title there, Order and Border. And starting, it says, like the economy in the previous channel, uh, chapter, every society has politics, and that's true, no matter what country you're from, okay? anywhere in the world. So although not every society has a central government and written laws, courts, police, jails, and armies, the things that we generally associate with or understand as politics, right? Like the big fight in the United States now with Republicans and Democrats. It seems Republicans are on the side of getting rid of uh, abortion, you know, free abortion, and that the taxpayers pay for it, and then the Democrats are saying you can't do that. So it's politics everywhere, right? Uh, as is the norm, which means normal, for cultural anthropology, we, cultural anthropologists, that is, we view politics in the widest possible comparative sense as all of the ideas, practices, and institutions that contribute to social order, keeping things in order. Um, and social control within a population. I don't think what we would call happening in Portland with the riots and burning and firebombing of uh, buildings and attacking the police, that's not social control and social order. So something, for example, has to be done there in uh, Portland. The ideas, practices, and institutions may be formal and explicitly, which means 100% explained to you, political, or they may be informal and overlapping one over the other with other aspects of culture mixed in. For example, economics, kinship, which we covered before, fa aka family connections, uh, religion, language, gender, and age. So like, for example, like in Iran, most of the laws are uh, uh, based and bound into the Muslim faith of the Quran. Where here in the United States, we're supposed to keep the laws separate from church, you know, church and state. And other places, maybe in Africa, there's kinship is a big uh, involvement there, right? Okay, so let's move on a little. Further, in keeping with the case of the Uzbeks in Uzbekistan, politics is not synonymous. Oh, Kodermenes, so synonymous, meaning the same thing with country or state. They have a different feeling about this. There is political activity and often political consciousness, which means where we realize something below the level of the state as well as above the level of the state. In other words, there are intra-state political identities and processes and extra-state or trans-state political identities and processes. Uh, I'm not going to question you on that. It's a little confusing, so being kind. 
Uh, we cannot assume, and the facts frequently disprove, that culture and identity are accurately represented by official political boundaries or limits, or by the official political classifications of people. Now, political anthropology, politics by which they meant government or civil society, not a chaotic society, uh, living in ordered groups or cities, the very word politics deriving or coming from the ancient Greek police for city, not police, but city, has been subject of study for philosophers and scholars for millennia. Millennia means thousands of years, right? Maybe since, it, I don't know, about the beginning, I don't know if we had philosophers during the caveman time. Who knows? Uh, both Plato and Aristotle wrote about it, and intellectuals from Thomas Hobbes to John Locke and John Jacques Rousseau commented on it. 19th century historians and ethnologists, the word we went over before, published studies on the evolution of political systems such as Maine's 1861 ancient law, anybody around in this class from 1861, and 1883 on early law and custom. See chapter one, you don't have to do that, don't worry. Pretty little head. And then Marx, of course, Karl Marx, analyzed political and social systems as historical products of material economic forces. That was his hot zone, he just loved to talk about the economic forces. He rarely, he rarely spoke about the other things. Okay, that's his uh, specialty point of view. Thus, as cultural anthropology emerged around 1900, it already had an abiding interest, strong interest, we could say, in political processes or how things are done politically and the systems themselves. According to George Balandier, political anthropology developed in the early 20th century as a project to what? To transcend particular political experiences and doctrines. Doctrines are the, you could say like the, the rule books for whatever system you're talking about. Okay. Especially for the conventional concepts of Western societies and to search for properties common to all political organizations in all their historical and geographical diversity. One, unfortunately, even in the 1960s, the old anthropological thinking was evident or seen in his assessment that political anthropology is concerned with the description and analysis of the political systems, their structures, processes, which means how they do things, and representations, how they represent themselves. Proper to societies regarded as primitive or archaic, which means kind of like out of date. So as not to be misunderstood, he reiterated, which means he said again or repeated that it is first of all a mode or recognition and knowledge of other exotic political forms. So you see they're always concentrating and worrying about other political systems. You know, it's like, well, it's not enough that our system is doing okay. What about that other country? And then what about that other continent? And how do they do it? Because they always want to compare, you know, all of these things. So uh, next, cultural anthropologists, of course, have shed or gotten rid of this obsession with primitive societies, certainly after the disciplinary crises of the 1970s. I will not go into that for you. Don't worry about it. Unless you want to read chapter two again, but it's up to you. Even Ballandier appreciated that political anthropology's reach, how far it goes, and potential extended far beyond exotic or archaic societies consisting of three political aims, 
A, to detach the political from historical society and state systems. B, to understand the processes of the formation and transformation of political systems. That is how political systems change over time and new political systems arise or come forth. And to engage in cross-cultural and comparative studies, see that again, cross-cultural and comparative study of political systems, not limiting our perspective to the West, but embracing the entire historical and geographical extension of human society. Uh, my issue with that is that it's like, uh, I don't know if you've heard this old saying, uh, you're doomed to failure if you open a restaurant and, you know, you try to have the you try to have food from every country. What's going to happen instead of concentrating on what you do, like say Italian food or Chinese food, is you're going to make a lot of people unhappy and you're not going to be able to survive. So here, to me, it's a little foolish that you just have to study every political system of every country, whether it's an island or, you know, a very small territory. And the, to me, it doesn't compare to like a large country like the United States or Russia or China, right? But that's their that's their aim. And that's what they like to do. Or, you know, that's like a, a friend of mine told me back in college, that's kind of like, a, you have to visit every country in the world and, 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 and meet a woman from each country before you decide who you want to marry. Well, you might be traveling to all those countries the rest of your life before you decide <laughs> which woman is the best, right? So continuing, some of the defining work of anthropologists in the first half of the century concentrated on what, students? Politics, particularly because such systems and structures were of crucial significance to social anthropology. So you can see they feel that that's a crucial, crucial tie into social anthropology, which is politics. Much of this research centered on Britain's colonial holdings in Africa, where politics was especially important and complex. Evans Pritchard, a student of Radcliffe Brown, produced the political system of the Anwak of the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan in 1940, the same year that he co-edited with Meyer Fortes, the epical African political systems, which featured a preface by their mentor, Radcliffe Brown, and chapters on various societies and kingdoms, including the Zulu. You know about Shaka Zulu, you should read about him, it's fascinating leader of the African nation, uh, Bemba, uh, Talensi, the newer by some of the leading social anthropologists, among them Max Gluckman, Audrey Richards. You do not have to remember these names. If you see this name, it'll be in the question and you just remember the material. Okay. Nadell and of course, <coughs> excuse me, Fortes and Evans Pritchard themselves in their introduction to the volume, Fortes and Evans Pritchard noted that two very different types of political systems prevailed in Africa. One with centralized authority based on the cleavages of wealth, which, you know, we could just say whoever had the most wealth, that's a fancy word. This is a writer trying to sound impressive. Uh, and then privilege and status that correspond to the dis distribution of power and authority. And the other without such central authority or administrative machinery characterized by no sharp divisions of rank, status, or wealth. The former they called the primitive states, the latter stateless societies. That's kind of tough, uh, you know, this last part, you know, no sharp divisions of rank, status, or wealth. So you didn't have a king or let's say a president or a monarch or a royal family or a high level government. 
you know, or if you did, they, they, they were closely related and there's no really big, sharp, you know, uh, divisions and then, or wealth. So very few people were not wealthy or most people did not have money. So I don't know how that functioned. That would be interesting to find out. So again, here in the middle, sophistication of political anthropology grew quickly, the sophistication. In a crucial 1954 study of political systems of Highland Burma, Burma, which is now, you know, the country, Myanmar, I've actually been there. I had a tour guide that snuck me into Myanmar from the Thailand side, and I think she tried to leave me there, so I was almost stuck in Myanmar, and I would have never come back to teach this class. Maybe I would have become a monk. I don't know. Uh, Edmund Leach discovered that political systems were neither stable nor absolutely distinct, which means different. In that region, two political styles, known locally as Gumsa and Umlau, alternated as Shan and Kachin societies interacted. So interesting, like two different families with two different political systems. And neither was stable or absolutely distinct. So they were very similar in their processes. This observation led him to question the paradigm or the structure of independent and bounded societies with unique cultures. Okay. The next year, Max Gluckman, Custom and Conflict in Africa, his book, question another political assumption that social order necessarily means peace and harmony. He found instead there, I guess, that competition and even open conflict or even fighting could be ordered and ordering, providing the structure of internally diverse societies. For, exa for example, segregation, ethnic conflict, civil war. So he's trying to say, you have these different societies and uh, they somehow coexisted or even it was a better society with a little bit of fighting, a lot of competition than saying, hey, we should you know, generally have peace all the time and think it goes better that way. Again, I don't know, you put this down on a basic level, you know, I don't know if you want to mimic that because it, it's kind of like, uh, if, like I said, if I'm putting it on a basic level or a personal level, let's say, you know, you're a couple and then with, within this group of your friends, there's, there's uh, five couples and four of you guys uh, more or less function well because you're doing the, uh, not relaxed, but, uh, you know, like they said here, you had the social order with peace and harmony, but there's always that one couple that they fight all the time. And even though you and your other couples think, I think maybe they should get a divorce. It's really bad. They somehow stay together. I don't know what keeps them together, but it works for them. So what I'm trying to say is, I don't know if you want to mimic that. It's like the old saying we had, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But again, uh, social anthropologists, they want to study everything and compare and try and mix. So that's what you're learning here. And now we're going to go into key concepts in political anthropology. For better or for worse, the early course of political anthropology was set by political philosophy and by sociology. Those were the two, two prongs, the two sources. Right? Not, you know, oh, hamburgers and pizza, like Demogen might say. No, 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 senor. These two disciplines gave anthropologists much of their terminology and many of their initial questions. So what they mean by the terminology is just like if computers like Apple, 
what have you come from, let's say, the United States, which they did, and it's introduced throughout the world. Uh, much of the computer terminology, which is new, started in English, so a lot of countries have to use it. That's the terminology. So these two disciplines gave original terminologies to cultural anthropologists. The fundamental question in the 19th century, as we have seen repeatedly, was how political and social systems evolved over time. A continuation of this line of thought is apparent in Morton Fried's 1967, The Evolution of Political Society, in which he divided the trajectory of political evolution into four stages. Maybe we're gonna get a question there, who knows? One, egalitarian, with no permanent uh, inequalities or political roles, that's what that means. Two, rank, with some inequalities and roles for which individuals compete, but are which are not usually hereditary. So that sounds like the army, army has rank, you know, you're a basic, you're a private, you're a sergeant, you're a lieutenant, captain, corporal, things like that. Three, stratified with formal inequalities and roles that are often associated with permanent and inherited social differences. Your class, a lot of people in countries are born poor, so they're in a poor class. Caste, uh, maybe like India, which has practiced a caste system. Wealth, you know, you're born wealthy, you should stay wealthy unless something happens, and then prestige. So even here, you could be the, like Michael Jackson's kids, and they never did you know, anything. Maybe they're going to be successful now and try something in their young age, but just being born as his kids, he already had a prestige. Four, state with specialized institutions to exercise control over a territory and the population. More influential still was Element Services 1962, primitive social organization, which presented the political typology known and used by most contemporary, uh, which means of the time, anthropologists. He classified political systems into number one, brand, exclusively associated with foraging societies, which we talked about foraging last week. You know, you're in the forest hunting for food and plants, that's foraging, consisting of small mobile groups, usually based on kinship bonds. At that time, yes, families would be very odd to have strangers. Just, hey, how you doing, buddy? Never met you before in the forest. Let's work together. Often with fluid membership, that is, members could easily join or leave and, you know, form their own group. In the band, there is no separate political life no government or legal system above the modest informal authority of family heads and ephemeral leaders. Two, tribe, composed of multiple family units or villages unified by what service called pan, which means many tribal sodalities, uh, right? Sodalities. Or enduring principles or institutions like lineage, age sets, people, especially men of the same general age for hunting. Might not be good to have a guy 80 years old out there hunting, poor guy. Ritual groups or religious specialists, secret societies, and such. There is thus an interlocking power system above the level of the local community. Three, chiefdom. A more centralized society with a formal head, the chief, or an entire hierarchical system of chiefs, so there might be a number of chiefs, often holding hereditary power, which means the chief came, his father was a chief, and the father before him was a chief, over a larger and denser population of people. Service stressed that yeah, chieftains are closely associated with redistribution practices. The chief acting as the center of the receipt. 
the disbursement of the society's wealth. So he says, you know, Hamilton gets one acre. Uh, Mr. Hong gets two acres, and Phil Cho gets three acres, right? Inku Chen gets six acres, right? He decides who gets what. He further reasoned that chiefdoms depended on a more sedentary lifestyle, which means not so much moving around. You kind of stay in one place. That's what they use the word on like senior citizens that stay home, you know, 95% of the time. It's like, I live a sedentary lifestyle. I rarely go out, you know, so that's what they mean. These people don't really travel around. And this sedentary lifestyle on the production of a surplus, because they have a surplus of food. So if they go crazy and, and forage a lot and they build a surplus, they don't have to forage again for a while. And on a division of labor and thus on the chief's ability to plan, organize, and deploy public labor. Chiefdoms were therefore more common in horticulture or advanced pastoral economies. So people who really did a lot of, uh, it's more than gardening. It's, uh, you know, labor intensive and you're growing for harvest. That's your horticulture. I guess uh, people that had some kind of pastoral or religious economy, like let's say the uh, the Amish. I'm sure you've seen the Netflix show about the Amish, right? The religious community originally from Germany, I think, and had been in Pennsylvania for I don't know 150 years. Okay, so moving to right here. To services, that's the author. Three pre modern political systems must be added. So, to the three that we just put up here, this one must be added. Once again, the state. All anthropologists and political scientists agree that the state is a new and distinct form of politics, first emerging in the civilizations of Mesopotamia, so think like Greece. And Egypt, some five or six thousand years ago, the state is more or less synonymous with the country in vernacular English, vernacular meaning common language, even considered not formal. It is a formal political system with a centralized government and a bounded territory, which means our country extends to this line like modern day countries, Mexico extends to the United States above it. And on the bottom, it extends to what is it, Guatemala. On one side, Belize on the other, right? And above the United States, it extends to Canada, okay? Within that territory and over the people residing in it, the state exercises sovereignty, which means, well, it says that is ultimately authority you know, supposedly we are the sovereign states of America, Mexico, they also have states too. It means we have our laws and control our country. The state customarily makes laws, issues currency, which is money, enters into treaties or contracts between countries. We will not attack you or can you send us some food and we'll send you some, I don't know, livestock in return. Maintains an army. Can you tell me the country that doesn't have an army? Costa Rica, okay. And declares wars and regulates and scrutinizes the population. For example, census, passport, and visa surveillance. So I don't know if they wanted to use study, but I guess they wanted to use scrutinize, but kind of a mix. Study and finding out what's going on with the society of the country. The founding sociologist, Max Weber, defined the state as an institution that successfully claims a monopoly, which means they're the sole owner, and the legitimate use of force within a territory. Weber is also the source of other key concepts in political science and political anthropology most basic concept is power, which he defined as the capacity of one individual 
group or institution to carry out its will in the face of social opposition. Now, this is, to explain this further, this is very obvious in a country like, let's say, North Korea, where you have Kim Jong-un. And whatever he says is the ultimate law. There is no Congress to go against him or other members of his government that can protest against him. What he says is that's it. Now, of course, he's in a totalitarian communist regime. Same thing in China with Ping. Uh, Ping is now going to shut off China from outside influence. If you saw the thing recently, people wanted to get money out of the bank. And he sent tanks and said, no, I'm not opening the banks. I forget which area of China that was. But he can do that. Yes, you know, he's a dictator. Uh, but what's shocking is the West, like the United States, everybody hated Trump. But Trump didn't have the power to just start a war and go crazy. If Congress said no, Trump had no power. And we saw that. So, and that used to be the same in uh, Canada. You know, again, the West, another beautiful big country that uh, people want to migrate there. But I recently saw something that really shocked me. And it sounded like something Kim Jong un would say or Ping or. Who knows, Putin? I, I don't know, you know. But he said, which is the basic right in the United States, Canadian citizens do not have the right to own a gun to defend themselves. I mean, that was just shocking. You know, that's a basic right here in the United States. And I guess it used to be in Canada, but he's destroyed that law and said, you do not have a right to defend yourself. But he has, you know, his own secret service and police protecting him. He doesn't have to worry about getting a gun to protect himself. So that's pretty crazy. Like, and he said it. You, you can go to a gun store and as a Canadian citizen and say, I want to buy a gun because my neighborhood's really violent now. A gang moved into the neighborhood. Nope, you don't have the right to do that. Shut up. Go back to your house. Scary. Scary stuff. I should not be happening in the West. Okay, but again, as it says here, I repeat it, the most basic concept is power, which he defined as the capacity of one individual, Trudeau, group, or institution to carry out its will, and that's his will, in the face of social opposition. And people have protested and said, no, we need to defend ourselves. It should be a basic right. Morton Fried followed Weber in contending that power is the ability to direct the behavior of other people, which he associated with force or sanction. So, again, we had the trucker issue in Canada a few months back, and uh, the people who helped them, he attacked their bank accounts. What government allows you to attack the bank accounts in the West? That's illegal, but he did it. Remember, it's his will, according to this author, Martin Freed. Authority, according to Freed, was the same ability to control people without the use of force or sanctions. He also followed Weber. He thought that was a better course. Weber famously identified three types of sources of power, which he called authority or legitimate power, the sort that followers willingly grant to leaders. Right? Authority is further based on one or more foundations, traditional, derived from custom or past practice, two, rational legal, derived from written laws, explicit rules, documentation and measurement, formal office and the like, charismatic, derived from the personal qualities, the charm, magnetism, grace of the leader. So I think that kind of happened, uh, like I said, most people were not happy with Trump probably would not have been happy with Hillary, but people found uh, Obama to be charismatic and uh, charming, okay? And then the next one, persuasion, or the ability to convince or manipulate people, often through control of resources and or the skillful use of language, right? So people can put, or like, 
what Putin's doing with controlling the gas in, in uh, Eastern Europe. He controls that and takes it back, and the Eastern Europeans suffer, right, like the Ukraine. So these are examples, uh, present day examples from different types of leaders. Coercion, that's not a good word, or the threat or use of physical force from corporal punishment to imprisonment to execution. So again, going back to like Kim Jong-un, and we had the uh, fellow from the United States that eventually he gave back. Unfortunately, he had already tortured him. And then he came back and he died in the U.S., but he was sent to prison with the use of physical force because he, mostly he looked at a poster or tried to take a poster down, but initially it's because he had a Bible. You're not allowed to bring Bibles into North Korea. Uh, the upshot or the positive side of the analysis of power is that power is not so much a characteristic of the political leader as it is a social relationship between leader and followers. I guess what they're trying to say there is that people kind of allow a lot of things, a lot of bad things. But I, I don't agree with that so much. I mean, when you talk at the top, like let's say Trudeau again, when he suddenly just came out and said that there's not much you can do there or if they supported him in doing that, I don't think so. But for example, in California, they keep on voting for people like Gavin Newsom and uh, Pelosi who have let the homeless and Garcetti, right? Let the homeless situation just get out of control and continues to grow. And then not fixing the roads, right? And other things that, that people need. So, that's a that's a people just not doing anything and then the same people thinking that, that they're doing a good job. Remember the shutdowns by Gavin Newsom during the pandemic. And he's thinking about doing it again when other states were not shutting down. And people, if they're unhappy with it, why do they keep on uh, voting on it? You know? So that's what they mean here. All right. And then we'll move on to the state as a cultural project cultural identity, and uh, memory, okay. Mm, my voice is getting a little sore, so I'm taking a drink of this hot liquid. I hope there's no alcohol in it. I don't know where it came, but was the ghost brought the hot liquid drink? It was very strong. Mm, pretty good. I'll have to uh, tip the ghost later. So here we go. In the 21st century, the world is a system of states. States are the main official actors on the global political stage in every inch of land, except perhaps Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, polar bears and many miles of ocean have been claimed by a state and often more than one. States seem very natural to us, but it is urgent to remember that they are not natural entities or things, beings, even when their borders follow geographical features like shorelines. Every state in the world is a historical and social achievement, and often incomplete, and an insecure one, more aspiration than fact. Again, this is the opinion of the author here, and uh, you might disagree with that. But uh, they're trying to say that even though if a border, again, when I talked about the lines of demarcation where Mexico stops and the United States starts and U.S. stops and Canada starts, they're like, that, we don't care. You know, that's not natural. And uh, even though you have that, that social achievement is not, is incomplete. So I don't know. Let's see how they back these uh, statements here. It says the United States is an instructive example or good example, of the processes by which a state forms and expands, including settlement, like you go to an area where nobody's living and you just settle there, conquest, taking it from another people who are there, like uh, say Native American Indians, and then purchasing, like United States bought uh, California, 
Arizona, New Mexico from Mexico, they bought those states. And then annexation where they kind of like, it depends, there's various ways they get the people there to vote on it and then they add it to the list of their possessions, countries. I guess, like Ping's trying to do that with Taiwan and said we want to annex Taiwan, but he'll, he'll use the, uh, he used the term that like they use in North Korea about reunification. Now, Korea was unified at one time, but Taiwan was never part of China. So it's incorrect language that they're using in China it was never part of it. It was Chiang Kai-shek's army that was defeated and escaped China and made their own country. So I don't know. As they add territory, states absorb more cultural diversity. That's true. The United States incorporated hundreds of Native American societies as well as regions with Hispanic, French, and other traditions and populations. So Hispanic would be um, California, Arizona, and uh, Nuevo Mexico, New Mexico. Can you guess where the French people were absorbed? Name a state that doesn't really sound like English. Louisiana, that's uh, French, and the French owned that. Okay, so they absorbed the French people that were there. But Louisiana was quite a mix. You had some Seminole Indians, Spanish were there too, Africans, quite an interesting place. That's why their food is so rich and diverse. You know, it's got so many ingredients in it. In areas colonized by Europe, Colonial boundaries were usually arbitrary, reflecting Western interests or the outcomes of specific events such as wars, rather than the cultural differences of colonized people. So, like let's say a country like uh, Alsace-Lorraine, which is between France and Germany, okay, it's been owned by France, it's been owned by Germany. I think France owns it now, I don't know, but there were still Western concepts, even though that people spoke a different language, right? There were not real big cultural differences of like colonized people. So when those former colonies became independent, they generally retained their colony, colonial boundaries, for instance, the political borders of Africa or the Middle East today are almost precisely or exactly the colonial border defined by Britain, France, and other European colonizers. The challenges of governing such states have been acute or sharp, and the results too often disastrous. That's an interesting statement. Let's see what I have to say about that. The problem in most newly decolonized states, but hardly only in those states, is a fundamental mismatch between political lines and social cultural lines. The state has its formal boundaries within which ideally exercise sovereignty. There's a sovereignty again, the ability to govern and make the laws of your country. It serves its population offering to and demanding of them citizenship in the state. However, people frequently do not identify with the state regarding their identity as below the state as defined by local and pre-state culture, language, religion, tribal, and such, and occasionally by a culture, language, or religion beyond the state. For example, the kinship spirit felt by the Arabs or Muslims across straight state frontiers. Well, for example, a lot of people, like I told you, like I give Iran as an example, most Muslim countries, the formal government, as we say, is based on the Quran or their Bible. So the laws are religious, not the separation that we have here or let's say in England, right? So a lot of those folks feel that their 
But when they let's say they, they come to another country, they feel like their religion uh, rules are stronger than whatever country that they're in, the new country that they're in. Okay. And another example here would be like when Mexico, Mexico actually had more different native people tribes than the US. And a lot of those folks, even though Mexico became Mexico and not New Spain, as it was called when Spain controlled it, uh, and they, so can I, everybody's a Mexican. A lot of the people that were Indian could not speak Spanish and were not Catholics, like the majority of the new government, and had tribal names and such, and didn't feel part of the state, but below. So that's what they're trying to say here. And you might have the same, even in a country like, uh, let's say, Thailand, right? I remember I was in Thailand and uh, I went to the mountains to uh, meet the long neck people. And there's different tribes up there and they are not originally Thai people. They're different and have a different language and culture. But now, you know, I guess they have Thai citizenship and are considered Thai people, but I'm sure they feel much different than, let's say, your traditional Thai person in Bangkok, right? So continuing here, political scientists use the term nation and distinction to state, which means different than state, to refer to the actual sentiments and ideas that bind people into integrated groups, accordingly the Cherokee, the Walpiti, the Uzbeks are nations inside the states of the United States, Australia, and Uzbekistan, respectively. That's why you'll hear Native American people. While, yes, they have a whatever Minnesota driver's license and United States citizenship, they feel their nation is bound to maybe their, obviously their tribe, but maybe to other Indian tribes as well. And that's what they'll call their nation, okay? No wall PDR in uh, Australia, okay? So the problem clearly is that the state boundaries and identities do not conform to the boundaries and identities of nations many states encompass or cover at least parts of two or more nations and many nations are divided across two or more states. The Western ideal of the nation state, of the state that contains all of and only one nation is seldom if ever realized. I don't know about being realized, it's just, you know, not everybody accepts it or feels part of it because again, it could belong to these different tribes or other groups. Uh, remember in Canada, on the north part of Canada, people speak French, the same country, but the north part speaks French and the, well, the eastern part speaks French and the western part speaks English, right? And they've talked about here that if, we continue to get more and more legal and illegal people from Central America and Mexico, and they settle here. Things get overwhelmed with Spanish. People might vote to say, hey, let's have, you know, California speak Spanish. That would be an interesting situation. Uh, on the bottom, as colonies gain independence in the second half of the 20th century, Cultural anthropologists and other social scientists took a keen or sharp interest in what they called these new states. Clifford Gertz, among others, predicted an integrative revolution. I don't know if revolution is a good word to use. Integrative is good, which means all things coming together. As older, narrow identities melted into more inclusive states, identities, the primary process for reaching this goal was nation building, which involved many dimensions such as creating an education system un or unifying markets, 
uh, laying and transportation and communication infrastructure, promoting one language or at most a few languages and establishing a statewide culture of which all members could be proud. I've heard this kind of thing in uh, New Mexico, okay? Where let's say before, uh, again, New Mexico is a state in the United States and you know it has its boundaries or whatever, but you basically just had like the Indian people and maybe the Spanish people that have been there for a long time saying we are we have a southwest feel here that you don't have any place else but since that's been promoted over time i mean you could have caucasian people asian people black people whatever that have lived there for a long period of time and they have now also become part of this new southwest nation you know so that's what they're talking about here Okay, but a common outcome in this situation is tension and conflict between peoples within the state and attempts to seize the state or take over the state or divide or exit the state. Right, again, we had this thing the last two years that California was trying to vote on separating from the United States and be their own country, California, because they like their new laws that they've come up with and whatever. And then you can have ethnic conflicts and terrorism and civil war have torn plural states from Sri Lanka to Northern Ireland. Uh, Sri Lanka, again, has just had a big, I don't know if you call it a civil war, but it took over the governmental office. So these things happen. The Basque people, usually from the mountainous area between France and Spain, are not happy inside the Spanish state. They want their own area. They want to have a, like a Basque country. And the Scots or Scottish narrowly defeated a 2014 referendum on the separation from the United Kingdom. Yes, they wanted to. A lot of people wanted to separate and say, we are Scotland. We're tired of British law and definitions. The Kurds have struggled against multiple states that dissect or take apart their territory including Iran doing that to them, Iraq and Turkey. The newest state in the world, South Sudan, founded only in 2011. Wow, that's 11 years ago. That's pretty freak, not recent. By breaking away from the general Sudan has plunged or dropped into a brutal struggle between two local tribes, the Nur and the Dinka. So they, poor folks, they, Fight it to the death out there. Hopefully they can find a resolution. Meanwhile, the indigenous peoples of the world, trapped inside old and new states alike, have become more actively or more active lately in exercising their own indigenous sovereignty. Okay. Now we talked about sovereignty before in a country having the sovereignty over its people. But here they're trying to say and insist that they were in our distinct self-governing peoples. So here it says, in many cases, as in the United States and New Zealand, Native peoples have formed treaties to back up their claims of sovereignty. Hundreds of American treaties and the 1840 Treaty of Waitango in New Zealand, a lot of these things that happened back in those days, 1840, they were not signed or they were not honored. And Native people were gra were granted a certain area of land, and they just were never given it. So they're trying to say now, hey, you owe us this land, right? For example, like I said, never being signed, Australia never signed treaties with its indigenous people. Once you talk about the Aborigines, they're the most famous, and because they regarded them as too primitive and disorganized for such a privilege. So they felt the Western society is taking over in Australia. You people don't even know how to govern yourself. So we made the treaty, but we never signed it. So that's an easy way later saying that we don't have to, you know, give it credit or actually do what it says. But since the 1976 Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Treaty Act, which I'm sure was signed, 
Aboriginal societies have argued quite accurately that Australia law is a white European law and that the Aboriginals have their own concepts of law and property. In order to stake successful claims to their lands, they had have had to introduce a new political concept, native title to Australian law, which Australian courts accepted in the 1993 Native Title Act. Based on such gains, Aboriginals and other Indigenous peoples have demanded more control over their economy, education, criminal justice, and other aspects of their lives. Uh, lives. I guess it makes me think of uh, like you have in Japan in the Hokkaido area where you have these people called the Ainu, and you know they have been on a large extent absorbed into the major Japanese society. A lot of them have Japanese names now, grew up speaking Japanese, going to Japanese schools. A lot of the Ainu language is lost, but some people have kept it going. And I guess if they get uh, more power like these aboriginals, they might demand similar things in that area of Hokkaido. They might even say, hey, this should be just for us. We should be able to have schools and you know, our language and different kinds of things because our laws were different than Japanese laws. So we'll see, but these kind of things are happening uh, all over the world. Okay, now on to the questions. That was a good read. That ended. Kind of went smoothly. Question one. According to George Ballandiers, the author, Political Anthropology, developed in the early 20th century as what? What did it develop into, right? So again, follow the author's name and keywords and you'll find the answer. I do that on purpose. Two, what was some of the defining work of anthropologists in the first half of the 20th century? Your keyword is defining. That should lead you to where you need to know. Unless you just remember off the top of your head because you have a photographic memory, it should be fantastic. That might be tall. I think tall has a photographic memory. Three, the early course of political anthropology was set by which two things? So which are the two things that set political anthropology in motion? Gave it, remember I said about, gave it its vocabulary. So that's a hint, hint. Four, author Elman Service, never heard of a person with the last name Service, uh, classified political systems into which three things? So you got to give me three, folks. If you give me one, it's not enough. If you give me two, it's not enough. So it's a good practice for your final, right? Five. All anthropologists, political scientists, feel the state in which way? So what do they think the state is? What is the description they give of the state, what it is? Okay, That's what I want there. Six, pick up sticks. What does the state customarily do? If you look in the reading, there is a list you know, that specifically have to give me all, I think the list might be six things, but uh, one and two and maybe three is not enough. Okay, so put it that way. So give me that list of the things that the state customarily does. Seven, as states add more territory, what happens? What happens within that state? What happens to the state? Does it change in any way? Please let me know. Eight, how do political scientists use the term nation in distinction or differently to the word state? Okay. So you might have to describe both of them so I can see the difference, all right? Nine, what is collective and social memory and what does it include? So tell me what is collective memory, what is social memory? And then there's a list of things that it includes. So. Give me that list. It's a shorter list than uh, number six, so don't worry.
And last but not least, number 10. Where is collective memory taught? Okay. That should be an easy giveaway question. Where is it taught? Oh, at the gas station? At the 7-Eleven? No. And then where is it stored? Where is its information stored? On the computer? I don't know. So those are your 10 questions for this week of order and order. And we are done with the reading. Okay. So stop share. All right, there I am. So, all right, folks. Again, this is for August the 29th. Finish this and we will start and I'll see you in September where it's going to get cooler. Okay. So everybody take care and uh, see you soon. All right. All right.